and welcome to Nittany Draws. My name's Nittany and I'll be coming at you today with chapter three of The Artist's Way. Um, <clears throat> so the previous couple of videos, uh, there were two videos for the prologue because there were two majorly separate parts of the prologue. And then the second, what, or sorry, the third was chapter one, chapter two, and then chapter three is now. So there's actually, this is the fifth video but this is chapter three. So if you're looking to find all of the creative cluster videos, then that's what this is. And the creative cluster is just what they call it when you work on this challenge as a group. I'm just gonna groom myself here. Um, I'm still growing my hair out, so I've got like that weird grow out time right now. So who knows what it's gonna do. But um, yeah, we'll take a drink of water and enjoy. Alrighty. Chapter three. This one was a really powerful week for me. And that is saying something. Uh, I was going through a lot when I did this chapter. And because of what I was going through, I think it made it especially frustrating and especially poignant. So chapter three, the summarization. This week may find you dealing with unaccustomed bursts of energy and sharp peaks of anger, joy, and grief. You are coming into your power as the illusory hold of your previously accepted limits is shaken. You will be asked to consciously experiment with spiritual open-mindedness. And, like, the first, <laughs> the first thing that is talked about um, on the first page of this, which starts on page 61... Um, the very first sentence, anger is fuel. We feel it and we want to do something. Hit someone, break something, throw a fit, smash a fist into the wall, tell those bastards. But we are nice people. And what we do with our anger is stuff it, deny it, bury it, block it, hide it, lie about it, medicate it, muffle it, and ignore it. We do everything but listen to it. Anger is meant to be listened to. Anger is a voice, a shout, a plea, a demand. Anger is meant to be respected. Why? Because anger is a map. Anger shows us what our boundaries are. Anger shows us where we want to go. In the recovery of a blocked artist, anger is the sign of health. And I got a lot of anger. A lot of it. <laughs> On page 62... Um, when we feel anger, we are often very angry that we feel anger. Damn anger. It tells us we can't get away with our old life any longer. Used properly, anger is useful. Anger is our friend. Not a nice friend, not a gentle friend, but a very, very loyal friend. Anger is not the action itself. It's action's invitation. And then she talks about synchronicity, which is strange because when I first heard about synchronicity, it was through this guy... And he wasn't a very nice guy. <laughs> he was a guy that I worked with and he fancied himself like super hipster dude bro. Um, he had an apartment that he basically used to pick up chicks and he only dated specific types of girls and he had sort of a love them and leave them sort of personality. And I worked with him in the restaurant industry, which I swear the restaurant industry just like exudes people like that. Like <laughs> it attracts people who are artistic types but who are never going to do anything with it and so this this was that guy and um he used to talk about synchronicity and I had such a negative opinion and understanding of synchronicity simply because of this guy for such a long time so when I first read about synchronicity in this book I immediately was like whatever you know I didn't even think about it so um she says in this book that there are going to be moments where you just kind of like push push a theory away and you say like whatever, and that was one of my moments where I was like whatever I don't care synchronicity is dumb, and then I read about it and it it's not really dumb, <laughs> but I had that funny reaction. So synchronicity answered prayers are scary and they imply responsibility, and one of her examples of this is. A woman is thinking about going back to school and opens her mail to find a letter requesting her application from the school she was thinking about going to. 
or a businessman who has secretly written for years, vows to, to himself to ask a professional writer for a prognosis on his talent. The next night, over a pool table, he meets a writer who becomes his mentor and then collaborator on several successful books. It's my experience that we're much more afraid that there might be a god than we are that there might not be. Incidents like those above happen to us, and yet we dis dismiss them as sheer coincidence, and that's synchronicity. Um, on page 64, God knows that the sky is the limit. Anyone's honest, anyone honest will tell you that possibility is far more frightening than impossibility, that freedom is far more terrifying than any prison. A discovery is said to be an accident meeting a prepared mind. Ask and you shall receive. Also on 64, toward the bottom, um, in outsized lives, such as such moments stand out in bas relief, large as Mount Rushmore, Lewis and Clark headed west, Isaac Dennison took off for Africa. We all have our Africas, those dark romantic notions that call our deepest selves. When we answer that call, when we commit to it, we set in motion the principle that C.G. Young dubbed synchronicity, loosely defined as a fortuitous intermeshing of events. Back in the 60s, we called it serendipity. Never ask whether you can do something. Say instead that you are doing it. <clears throat> On page 66, first choose what you would do. The how usually falls in place itself. Remember that creativity is a tribal experience and that tribal elders will initiate the gifted youngsters who cross their path. We like to pretend it is hard to follow our heart's dreams. We say we're scared by failure, but what frightens us most is the possibility of success. And then on page 67, there's a new header, and that's shame. And I think that shame is a very powerful emotion that many of us who are artists experience. And I think that, that putting a piece of ourselves out there for the world to consume, and we live in a very consumable society, and when we put something out there that we've put our blood, sweat, and tears into, that we've spent a lot of time working on. We put it out into the world, and then people look at it, and they're like, whatever. <laughs> and then it's like, ugh. And then we become shame shamed by that, that feeling of no one cares. No one likes what I'm doing. Nobody's interested in what I'm doing. And it's really difficult to deal with. Um, so here's what she has to say. Shame is a controlling device. Shaming someone in an attempt is an attempt to prevent the person from behaving in a way that embarrasses us. Art brings things to light. It illuminates us. It sheds light on our lingering darkness. Art opens the closets, airs out the cellars and the attics. If a child has ever been made to feel foolish for believing in himself or herself, the act of actually finishing a piece of art will be fraught with internal shaming. Many artists begin a piece of work get well along into it, and then find as they near completion that the work seems mysteriously drained of merit. It's no longer worth the trouble. To therapists, this surge of sudden disinterest, it doesn't matter, is a routine coping device employed to deny pain and ward off vulnerability. Adults who grew up in dysfunctional homes learn to use this coping device very well. They call it detachment, but it's actually numbing. No bone would really meet with parental approval. Not all criticism is shaming. We can learn to comfort our artist child over unfair criticism, and we can learn to find friends with whom we can safely vent our pain. If you're a good artist, a brave artist, you are doing well. It's good that you did the work. But I did tell my inner, inner artist, you will heal. So, <laughs> um, there's a section about taking criticism, and I want to read that section in its entirety, and that's because criticism is hard. <laughs> it can be so hard to take. And when we take it, it's just overwhelming at first. So, yeah, I'm going to read that section. So on page 72 in my copy is where it starts. There are certain rules of the road useful in dealing with any form of criticism. Receive the criticism all the way through and get it over with. Jot down notes to yourself on what concepts or phrases bother you. Jot down notes on what concepts or phrases seem useful. Do something very nurturing for yourself. Read an old good review. Recall a compliment. 
Remember that even if you have made a truly rotten piece of art, it may be a necessary stepping stone to your next work. Art matures spasmodically and requires ugly duckling growth stages. Look at the criticism again. Does it remind you of any criticism from your past? Particularly shaming childhood criticisms. Acknowledging to yourself that the current criticism is triggering grief over a long-standing wound. Write a letter to the critic, not to be mailed. Defend your work and acknowledge what was helpful, if anything, in the criticism. Get back on the horse, make an immediate commitment to do something creative, and then do it. Creativity is the only cure for criticism. Number 74, growth. A creative recovery is a healing process. Practice being kind to yourself in small, concrete ways. Practice saying yes to help. More than anything else, experiment with solitude. You will need to make a commitment to quiet time. Try to acquire that habit of checking in with yourself. Several times a day, just take a beat and ask yourself how you are feeling. Listen to your answer. Respond kindly. If you're doing something very hard, promise yourself a break and a treat. Yes, I'm asking you to baby yourself. We believe that to be artists, we must be tough and cynical, intellectually chilly. Leave that to the critics. As a creative being, you will be more productive when coaxed than when bullied. And then the tasks for the week, which I did all of the tasks. I like to do all of the tasks because I sit down for about three hours in preparation for each of these videos. Um, and I do each section of the chapter all on its own. I do a lot of highlighting. Um, you can see a good page for highlighting. Uh, so that's what my book looks like. Um, and I have a lot of notes in the margins and stuff. And so when I do that, I do all of the tasks. But at the very beginning of the book, she says, just, just do a few of them. You don't have to do all of them. Do like one that you really want to do. Do one that you really don't want to do. And then do another one that you're just kind of like, eh. Um, because it'll allow you to have a little bit more of a, like an open section of things. So <laughs> that's what she says to do. Uh, task number one for the week. Describe your childhood room. If you wish, you may sketch the room. What was your favorite thing about it? What's your favorite thing about your room right now? Nothing. Well, get something you like in there. Maybe something from that old childhood room. I'm going to start reading some of my bits and pieces from this. And so my favorite childhood toy was my PlayStation. It meant the world to me when my mom was able to buy it, especially because I knew she couldn't really afford it. Number two, my favorite childhood game was Final Fantasy VIII. I still can't watch the ending because I'm scared of it ending. I like literally I've. The game came out in 1999, and I still haven't watched the ending because I don't want it to end. Number three. The best movie I ever saw as a kid was White Oleander. I loved that Astrid was able to move past her terrible childhood to go create great art with her sexy comic author boyfriend. Number four. I don't do it much, but I enjoy going bowling. It's a physically tiring activity that I'm not awful at. <laughs> I'm not physically inclined. If I weren't so stingy with my artist, I would buy her classes to teach the basics and foundation skills, which that's part of what I'm doing right now um, with the Self-Improvement Tuesday. Uh, yeah, so these videos, this is the first of the series, but I have a lot of step-by-step -step, like self-improvement sort of books, but most of them are art-related. And so I'm going to try to make this an ongoing series where on Tuesdays I put out a video specifically related to self-improvement and, you know, making my career better. Um, and then on Wednesdays, it will be my art videos. So you can see a little bit of both. I'm afraid that if I start dreaming, I will get my head in the clouds, never achieve it, and live the rest of my life sad and unfulfilled. If it didn't sound crazy, I would make a how-to series for artists. My parents think artists are broken souls with no money. My God thinks artists are the people closest to the light, the people who she works through on earth. Learning to trust myself is probably the hardest thing I've thought of doing. And then the tasks. So what does your room look like when you were a kid? What does it look like now? And what are you happy with? So the walls were all skin colored beige, very close to my own skin color, except for the main wall, 
which is a deep reddish brown, almost like dried blood. The carpet was midnight blue. I had done murals on the door and had black horizontal blinds on the windows. I slept on a black futon with gray sheets and a comforter done in an Asian motif. My mom had hung paper lanterns, which I could turn on with a click switch. I had a hutch-style desk for my computer, a TV stand for my clothing, and a coffin with shelves in it, which I used to house my comic book collection. There was always tons of clothing all over the floor, and I never knew what was clean or dirty. That's still true. My favorite thing about my room was that it was mine. No one ever came in, and usually I was left alone if I was inside. My favorite part of my room now is that it's dark and relaxing with light neutral colors. And I went out of my way to be super anal retentive about color choices throughout my whole house. My, my office is really bright and happy, but every other room in my house is different shades of cool grays. It's sort of nautical, sort of farmhouse, and it's very relaxing. <laughs> Describe five traits that you like in yourself as a child. Number two, lit, that was number two, sorry. Number three, list five childhood accomplishments. Straight A's in seventh grade, train the dog, punched out the class bully, short sheet of the priest bed, and a treat. List five favorite childhood foods. Buy yourself one of them this week. Yes, jello with bananas is okay. Number four, habits. Take a look at your habits. Many of them may interfere with your self-nurturing and cause shame. Some of the oddest things are self-destructive. Do you have a habit of watching TV you don't like? Do you have a habit of hanging out with a boring friend and just killing time? There's an expression. Some rotten habits are obvious. Overt, drinking too much, smoking, eating instead of writing. List three obvious rotten habits. What's the payoff in continuing them? Some rotten habits are more subtle. No time to exercise, little time to pray, always helping others, not getting any self-nurturing, hanging out with people who belittle your dreams. List three of your subtle foes. Use what use do these forms of sabotage have. Be specific. Make a list of friends who nurture you. That's nurture. Give you, gives you a sense of your own competency and possibility. Not enable. Give you a message that you will never get it straight without their help. There is a big difference between being helped and being treated as though we are helpless. List three nurturing friends, which of their traits particularly serve you well. Call a friend who treats you like a really good, bright person who can accomplish anything. Part of your recovery is reaching out for support. The support will be critical as you undertake new tasks. Number seven, your inner compass. Each of us has an inner compass. This is an instinct that points us toward health. It warns us when we are on dangerous ground and it tells us when something is safe and good for us. Morning pages are one way to contact it. So are some other artist brain activities. Painting, driving, walking, scrubbing, running. This week, take an hour to follow your inner compass by doing an artist brain activity and listening to what insights bubble up. List five people you admire. Now list five people you secretly admire. What traits do these people have that you can cultivate further in yourself? Number nine. List people who, wish, who you wish had met, but who are dead. List five people who are dead whom you'd like to hang out with for a while. What traits do you find in these people that you can look for in your friends? Number 10. Compare the two sets of lists. Take a look at what you really like and really admire and look at what you think you should like and admire. Your shoulds might tell you you admire Edison while your heart belongs to Houdini. Go with the Houdini side of you for a little while. And then the check-in. How many pages th did you do in your morning pages? Or how many days did you do your morning pages? How was the experience? If you skipped a day, why? Did you do your artist date? Yes, yes, and it was awful. What did you do? How did it feel? Did you experience any synchronicity this week? What was it? Were there any issues this week that you consider significant to your recovery? Describe them. So with the check-in. Check-in. Uh, I did all of the days in the morning pages. Ah, yay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. The last couple of weeks I have not done that. The last couple of weeks I've gotten to like four or five days. This week I got them all done. Uh, last night was the hardest night for me to actually sit down and do it because my husband's been gone for a week. So while he's been gone, I have been able to suck it up and get all my stuff done. I've like a head on video production and editing and. <laughs> And I did all my morning pages and I got ahead in the book and blah, blah, blah. I did so much because I was bored. And now that he's home, uh, yeah, 
Last night was a lot harder to sit down and actually get it done because he was home and I wanted to hang out with him instead of go and do the stuff that I needed to do. Artist date. I did not do an artist date this week. I didn't leave the house. This week I only had one day off and today's that day. Um, usually I have Wednesdays off and the reason that I have Wednesdays off is so that I can do all of my YouTube stuff that day. So I didn't actually have any time to go do anything. I could kind of count going to the dog park with the dog, but I didn't it didn't really feel like an artist day. It wasn't time that I'd carved out for myself. It was really for the dog. So I don't really count it. Did I experience any synchronicity this week? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, I'm dealing with some business related ick. I can't really talk about it a whole lot because it's, you know, business related and I don't want to like say something really negative about someone on the internet because who knows how that will be taken. Um, but I'm related, I have some business related icky stuff going on and because of that business related ickiness, I have had some really cool things happen in my personal life that is outweighing the ick. We'll say it that way. Were there any issues this week that you consider significant for your recovery? Yeah, that, uh, business related ick is definitely helping me learn how to deal because it's a major part of growing thicker skin and also not letting not mixing business with pleasure and a part of uh, professionalism and learning to be a better professional and not expect everyone else around you to be able to do it because most of them don't so I won't say anything else and that's the end of the chapter chapter four is what's coming up next and I am interested to see how you guys are doing. Um, I uh, would love to have some comments or some video responses would be extra cool where you like do this stuff for yourself or tell me if you're doing the book, how you're experiencing your recovery thus far. Um, if there were any parts of this that you have had trouble doing or that are very frustrating for you. Um, like I, I made a modification for myself where I'm doing my morning pages. I'm doing them at night <laughs> before I go to bed because I don't get up in the morning. I don't want to get up in the morning. I don't want to change that about myself. I don't, I understand that everybody else thinks that getting up in the morning is the mark of a really, really great CEO. And if you don't get up first thing in the morning, you're never going to be successful. That's not me. <laughs> it's just not me. I don't like to get up anytime before eight o'clock. And if I had to do my morning pages in the morning, I would have to get up at 7.30 and I don't want to do that. I just don't. So instead, I am staying up a little bit later to do my morning pages before I go to bed. So I'm interested to see if there's any other modifications that other people are doing um, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the end of this episode. I'm going to start posting these on Tuesdays. That way I can make a schedule again because we get to stay here instead of having to move. So uh, my husband got the new job and we get to stay here in our wonderful little town. And I get to keep my house. <laughs> I don't have to move into another house that's smaller and in the middle of nowhere also. My husband got the job so I don't have to move now, which is awesome. And that means that I can go back in a two video a week schedule. And that schedule is lined up over here. I'll show it to you real quick. So this is the calendar of Doom. And so you can see, like, that's my Wednesday art videos. And then this is Self-Improvement Tuesdays. And then this is the Creative Arts Collaboration Group event. And then... I have a bunch of other things up my sleeve. I've got a couple of collaborations coming up pretty soon here. I've got um, another book that I'm going to start pretty soon here. Uh, another self-improvement book. We are on chapter four now here, which means that we're a third of the way through the book already. Um, so in, what is that? Eight more weeks? Nine more weeks? Something like that. We'll be all done with this book, and I feel like I should look. Where are we at here? 
So we just did chapter three. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we have nine more weeks left of we have nine more weeks left of the artist way and then after the artist way we're going to start another book series and that one is a specifically art related series um and i won't tell you about it yet until i get the book in the mail that way i can kind of do an announcement and show everyone um so that is about that because this is the longest video that's ever existed and i will see you in the very next video